Good evening. My name is Sean Samuels and I'm a sergeant with Durham Regional Police Service. On behalf of the Regional Municipality of Durham, the Ontario Black History Society, Durham One, the Canadian Jamaican Club of Oshawa, and Durham Regional Police Service, I'd like to thank you all for participating in our Black History Month event tonight. It's a true honour for us to celebrate the many achievements and contributions of Black Canadians who throughout history have done so much to help build and make Canada a caring, compassionate and culturally diverse nation. It is also important for each of us to learn about, understand and appreciate our differences in order to strive toward a future that allows for us to reap the benefits of living in a multicultural society where the value and dignity of all is recognized. On that note, we will now deliver an acknowledgement of territory. It is important to make note of the relational and contextual quality of this protocol. An acknowledgement of traditional territory is an invitation to reflect on personal relationships with Indigenous nations. When we acknowledge treaty, we are asking individuals to explore their rights and responsibilities to place and people. And when land is acknowledged, we are encouraging you to seek out the history and teachings of the natural world. We would like to begin this by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe Mississauga, adjacent to the Mississaugas of Scugog Island, First Nation, and in the territory covered by the Williams Treaty. This place is and will continue to be home to Indigenous peoples. Let us move forward together with kindness and respect. Thank you. Now, with this being the first of four book discussions that we will be hosting with various Black Canadian authors throughout the year, we certainly hope you will find this session, as well as the ones that follow, follow very useful and informative. Tonight, we feel very privileged to kick off this year-long initiative with recent Order of Canada recipient, Mr. Denham Jolly, who is here with us to share his thoughts on his book, In the Black, My Life, as well as his experiences as a Black Canadian. So without further ado, I'll turn over the conversation to DRPS's director, Dr. Vidal Chavans, as the moderator, and Mr. Denham Jolly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sergeant Samuels. So uh, as indicated, my name is Vidal Chavan. I'm the Director of Strategy Research and Organizational Performance with Durham Regional Police. Um, before I introduce you, Mr. Jolly, I wanted to say a couple of things. I'm, I'm normally a behind the camera kind of guy. I have a, a life partner who looks after the front of the camera stuff for both of us. But when I heard that, well, first, when I was asked to participate, and then secondly, when I heard that you were the first guest for the book club, uh, I jumped. There was no hesitation because um, there are some things that I want to say to you directly on behalf of myself, certainly on behalf of everyone on this call and everyone who could not join tonight. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing, for the fights that you fought, for the firsts that you attained, for the gifts that you've given and for the ones that you are yet to give. And thank you, sir, for telling your story. Um, sometimes we wait too long to tell people thank you. So I did want to say that tonight before I introduce you. Thank you, Mr. Jolly. All right. And for any of you who may not know this man, I'm going to give you the long version of the bio because I want to make sure that you understand who you're dealing with tonight. Mr. B. Denham Jolly is an award-winning businessman, recognized philanthropist, successful entrepreneur, publisher, author, civil rights activist who is highly respected for his business acumen and community efforts. He's a graduate of McGill University and founder, president, and CEO at one time of Canada's first Black-owned radio station, Flow 93.5 in Toronto. In 1982, he founded the Black Business Professional Association and was the first president and led the Harry Jerome Awards. Additionally, he provided a voice for the black community as publisher and financial backer for the weekly newspaper Contrast. 
Jolly was also the owner and president and CEO of Tyndall Nursing Homes in Ontario and Texas and successfully operated his senior care business for over 40 years. He's named in the who's who of Ontario, Canada's who's who, and the international who's who of professionals and is also acknowledged as a prominent African Canadian in how the Blacks created Canada. He served as the director of the Toronto International Film Festival among his many credits. He's been recognized with an astounding list of awards, the Queen's Golden Jub Jubilee Medal, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, Canada's 125th Confederation Medal for Community Development Contribution and Canadian Urban Leadership for City Soul Award. Mr. Jolly's community affairs include the Jamaican Canadian Association, the Black Action Defense Committee, the Committee for Due Process, the Daphne da Costa Cancer Association, the Jane and Finch Concerned Citizens Movement, the Black Inmates Organization, the Harriet Tubman Games, the YMCA, Carabana. In February of 2017, he released this fantastic book that we're going to talk about tonight, In the Black, My Life, that traces his personal and professional struggle for a place in a country where Black Canadians have faced systemic discrimination. In, in August of 2019, Mr. Jolly paid off the outstanding mortgage of the Jamaican Canadian Association with a $312,000 donation so that they could own their building. In November of 2020, the Governor General of Canada appointed Mr. Jolly with one of Canada's highest civilian honours, the Order of Canada, for his outstanding achievement and service to the nation. Today, Mr. Jolly continues his work as a philanthropist and a community activist, and it is an absolute pleasure, sir, to welcome you to this conversation. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Savaz. I, uh, and thanks to all the sponsors of this event. I've often said I'm not quite sure why people want to hear my story, but uh, if I could uh, bury my uh, my my uh, shyness a little bit, uh, after hearing that introduction that you gave, I I think it's probably worthy of a couple of seconds. <laughs> but but thank you very much, and and thanks again for having me. Again, I don't know why people would want to hear my story. I'm always uh, very humbled about it. I. Uh, I grew up in a home where my mother was all and father were always helping people and coming to Canada and not seeing uh, the kind of uh, treatment that I was accustomed to. I thought I'd do something about it for the less privileged among us. So and the reason I wrote the book was. I think a lot of. Uh, Caribbean people, and I've discovered recently my my dentist doesn't know her her grandmother. A lot mm -hmm. of us don't know the line of ancestors that we had because when we were kids and could have gotten some information, we were told to be seen and not heard. And then when we got older and found it was important to know and got very much interested in where we came from for our progeny. The people who had the information were all gone. So I wrote that book. To. Put down a chronicle of my life for. My my. Uh, my progeny. I, as I often say to people, it had unforeseen circumstances um, or what do they say uh, unexpected consequences <laughs> luckily they were positive so here we are today discussing it and thank you for having me again no worries and i'm just gonna i'm gonna put it up on the screen again because i want to make sure if you haven't picked this up make sure you pick it up fantastic read um so i'm gonna ask you a couple questions about some of the content in here Absolutely. And uh, for sure. So, I mean, let's not beat around the bush. I worked for Durham Regional Police. 
Sean, who you just met, works for Durham Regional Police. The book opens with you recounting an incident with a Toronto police officer. It's on Parliament Street. You're involved in a minor fender bender and the officer demands that you call a tow truck. Um, in the conversation that ensues, he suggests that he might have to point a gun in your face if you don't do it. This wasn't very long ago, actually. No, um, yeah. actually, uh, if I could take the liberty of making a slight correction here, sure. it was a little more severe than that. Um, he told me that I had to use the tow truck that he had called. Mm. And I said, well, I have my own tow truck because I have, my car has roadside assistance. I am a member of the CAA and my kids play hockey with a gentleman that own tow trucks. And I really, I appreciated his help, but I really didn't. Uh, I've been around the block a few times and I prefer to control the circumstances around where my car is going, how much it's going to cost and so on and so forth. So I thought, why not? I have my own tow truck. He took objection to that. He said, no, no, no. You have to use that tow truck. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I have my own tow truck. Right. But no, so, you have to use that tow truck or I'm going to give you a charge you with careless driving and give you a ticket for 500 bucks. I said, well, you know, I know my rights. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have to use your tow I, I, you know, I, as you say, I'm an activist and I don't like to be pushed around and have my rights taken away. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, I know my rights and I don't have to use your tow truck. So he says at that point, do I have to put a gun to your face? And I thought, really? Mm -hmm. So I shouted out on busy Parliament Street, now you want to shoot me? <laughs> <laughs> and it went on from there. Um, I went directly to the police station and made a complaint. Mm -hmm. uh, it took forever to be called in by the detective to hear my side of the story. When I went in, he said, uh, oh, we're going to charge him. It's not so much uh, over your incident, but there's some other incidents that we're going to charge him for. I gather he had his, his, uh, his mouthpiece turned off. So I left there feeling that uh, this guy was going to be charged. In 10 days, I got a letter from, from the same officer saying, we couldn't substantiate your claim. Mm -hmm. So I, I made a, an appeal to the higher ups, OPRID or whatever, mm -hmm. and we got a lawyer and asked for a copy of the transcript. Well, in that very, I, I figure the, the, the detective was probably quite truthful in saying we're going to charge him. Probably, and I am surmising, but I live in, I've lived in this country, and I, I say in the book, I know these people more than they know themselves. Mm -hmm. He probably went to his superior, and his superior said, what, you're going to charge a guy for, for, for some black guy? So it came, when I saw the report, it said, Mr. Jolly, a 77-year-old Jamaican immigrant, Right away, I knew what the whole story was. Mm -hmm. I'd been a citizen for 50 years. And what does that have to do with anything, with a car accident? Mm -hmm. so, so right I know, I, I knew where they were coming from. All right. So at this point, you had been in Canada for 50 years and you read- I'd been this. here for 62 years. 62. I'd been a citizen for 50 years. Right. And you read, you read this report indicating that um, that there was a Jamaican immigrant involved in this this incident, and they were referring to you, um, and that helped shape sort of your your rationale for writing down your story in this oh, book. Oh, uh, absolutely! I thought people had to know. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of my colleagues were saying after they read the book, "Oh, I didn't know this sort of stuff goes on. Oh, I didn't know." But I find it hard to know that. That uh, you know, all the a lot of these incidents are, are in the, the media. They ought to know what goes on. 
for sure. So you would, you know, you've been in this country for a long time. You would have seen over the course of, you know, the last 50 years, some of the more highly publicized incidents involving Toronto police or police in other jurisdictions and their interactions with black communities. And I guess, you know, one of the questions that I have for you, we're, we're speaking in, in 2021 on the heels of a global movement that has shone a light on anti-black racism and particularly on the relationship between black communities and police. Um, over the course of the time that you've been in this country, have you seen it change? What's your thoughts about the state of the relationship now? Well, it's not uh, salubrious. It's not super. It's changed somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, not to the extent that it should. We're nowhere near there. Um, in, in the late 70s, there was a, a gentleman named Buddy Evans, a young man who was shot and killed by 13 policemen at the Flying Disco at King and Bathurst. And in fact, at that time, Rami Armstrong, myself, and Al Hamilton started the Committee for Due Process. We insisted that we know he wasn't going to be charged with murder. There were 13 policemen there to arrest this guy. And with great respect to the constabulary and to you gentlemen, if 13 policemen can't subdue an unarmed man, then, you know, they should look for another line of work. Mm -hmm. But so we figured we know we're not going to charge him in the 70s with murder. So we insisted on having a coroner's inquest. And at that time, we insisted and we put our hand in our pocket and hired a top notch criminal lawyer, Jack Brinkowski, for the coroner's inquest. And at that time, we, between the press and the judicial system, we made that, we stored on that case, we marched, we demonstrated at City Hall and kept it in their face. We brought it up at the legislature. It became the longest inquest in the history of Ontario in a single death. The longest inquest in the history of Ontario. So, mm -hmm. but, but things are still not the way they should be with, uh, with uh, at the time of the incident with the car, I said to myself, here I'm 77 years old. What would have happened if it was a 19-year-old kid from, J I was driving a Lexus. What if it was a 19-year-old kid from Jane Finch driving a beat-up Chevrolet? What would, he, would he have shot him? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, and certainly sobering to think about, you know, you having been on the front lines of some of those battles that were fought uh, as a matter of fact th this gentleman did uh charge me with careless driving and i got a lawyer and went to court mm. while we were sitting outside on a bench waiting for a case to be called up one of the lawyer's friends came up to him and said you know the, the guy you're here uh with the case against the policeman he's, nobody wants to work with him no he's, he's not a nice guy he didn't use those terms I had a case with him last month defending a South Asian gentleman who this same policeman, is, this this gentleman, had, his kid was sick. So he pulled over to the side of the road for the kid to get sick. And this policeman pulled up behind him and said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, what are you doing here? And... Uh, the South Asian gentleman said to him, my kid's sick, can't you see that? I said, no, no, what are you doing in Canada? <laughs> so, you know, that's the kind of attitude and respect that people of color get, and it's still not, not optimal. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. And it works both ways. It works both ways, you know, you have to give people respect, to get mm -hmm. respect. Absolutely. So I wanted I want to actually take you back because at the beginning you mentioned and I should say before I ask this question, there are questions coming up in the chat that I'm going to get to. If you have any questions, those of you who are, are joining us online, put them in the chat. We have moderators that are picking them up and then they're passing them over to me on the screen here and I will absolutely try to get to as many of them as I can. 
But Mr. Jolly, at the beginning, when you were providing your opening comments, you were talking a little bit. I want to shift gears a bit. You were talking a little bit about your mom and dad. Um, maybe you can just for a brief moment, talk about where you grew up, what it was like with your mom and dad and how, you know, they contributed to you becoming the man that you are now. Well, my, my mom and dad set a, a, an example of, of giving and humanity and humanism for me. Uh, in fact, my mother was, a, a, was a justice of the peace and sat on the family court. And being a small town, I, I grew up in Green Island, Jamaica. Most people don't know where that is, and I'm not going to tell them. They don't want them to know about it. Um, and she was at home one day, and someone came, small village, and said, oh, you know so-and-so from around the cove. Um, she was a young mother that had a, a little problem, and the judge had sent her to... Uh, the prison. And my mom immediately put a dress on, went to the court, and had a private audience with the judge and said, you know, she's a young mother, she's got a young kid, what's, what's going to happen to her child? And, and he uh, reversed his decision. That was the kind of person she is. If we were home having dinner and some one of our friends who were less fortunate came by, she would make sure they came and sit at the table with us and had dinner. In fact, we had the only well in the, we didn't have running water. And we had the only fresh water well in the village. And in the mornings, there was just a steady stream of people walking right through the yard to get water from this well. And my father never cared. In fact, every Christmas, he would kill a cow or something and had a big party for the whole village. So we grew up in a community of sharing. My mother started a school for uh, for the, the kids there that would not have had learning. In fact, the school was taken over by the government and it's now called Cousins uh, Industry, Basic, Industry Cove's Basic School. Mm -hmm. And it's being run by the government, and I'm a I'm a mentor of that school actually right now. So, my my family, that we weren't rich, but uh, we were a little more fortunate than everyone else. We had uh, a fair amount of land on the waterfront, so we had a pretty idyllic life. My father had horses, so I learned to ride, and we had a pretty good time. Mm -hmm. And my mother, the, my mother was into education, even though she never went to high school, nor did my dad. But yeah. they saw the value of education and insisted and tried very hard to afford for us to go to school, me and my, my brothers and sisters. There were five of us. Mm -hmm. So we uh, had an idyllic life, I would say, because it's kind of relative and we didn't think we needed anything, so we had a fantastic time. Fair enough. One of the questions that's coming up in the chat, I'm going to get to right now, um, but I want you to hold on to the education thing because I'm going to get back to it. Um, okay. One of the questions coming up in the chat that was asking about whether or not you still go back to Jamaica. Um, how often and do you still have family there? Well, I haven't been for the last year because of COVID. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. I, I still have family there. I have a, a sister who was principal of the Montego Bay High School for Girls in Montego Bay. She was the first black principal mm -hmm. that uh, ended the colonial rule on Montego Bay High School. I have a sister who is a, was a registered nurse and is retired. And I have a brother there who uh, does his own thing. He was managing a property for... Uh, which I sold to a company from Spain that's building 200, 2,000 rooms in a hotel there in Green Island. Mm -hmm. And I go back quite a, I used to go back every six weeks. We have a place in uh, Negril, a beachfront cottage, and we enjoyed it very much. We're very uh, sorry we can't go right now. There's not, not the best time for traveling. For sure. 
I think um, I think one of the things that they told me about this is if I did this call with you, that I would get a trip to the cottage. But I mean, we'll, we could talk about that. Absolutely, later. absolutely. Just let me know. <laughs> so I want to get back to education because you've mentioned it a couple times with your parents and then with your sister. Um, you refer to uh, the education in Jamaica as you were growing up as, and I quote this, as thoroughly and unrelentingly British. Yes, and I'm curious, I'm curious to hear about that, but then also about your thoughts about our current education system and whether, whether there are still some lessons to learn about ensuring that it, it is a bit more inclusive. Well, as I said, um, my sister was the first Jamaican to head up this high school. It was always British people. So that was the situation. Um, I've always answered that question by saying, I knew more about the Tudors and Stewarts than I knew about Marcus Garvey or any, any of our heroes. Um, mm -hmm. I knew nothing about Jamaican history. I'm, in fact, I'm learning more about it now than I knew then. And as, as, as a colleague of mine referred to, these dead white men like Shakespeare and, and and Chaucer and we knew nothing about our, our own people. Mm -hmm. And it I don't, I don't think it did anything for self-esteem because we were made to think that if it's not British, it's not the best thing for us. And our my headmaster was a was a, was an Englishman. We, and uh, a lot of the staff were Englishmen. In fact, I had a math teacher who liked to talk about the Coxwells, which is a place near Oxford in England. And very little about our island and very little was encouraged to be taught about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's, it's probably changing somewhat. I'm, I'm mentoring a, a young lady in high school right now who is in sixth form. And just yesterday, my partner and I were looking over her results and we see where she had Caribbean studies on her, uh, on her report card, which we thought was a good thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, in my day, there was nothing of that nature. And uh, you, you, were tr you were groomed to be British. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was infradict to speak patois anywhere on school property hmm. at high school. You know, you you had to speak the school's in, the king's English at all times. Mm -hmm. So it was very colonial, and um, it was very effective because to this day I say to my colleagues, you know, I think that colonialism got in our DNA. Hmm. Because it's very hard to get out of. It, it is so subliminal that we hardly know about it. We mm -hmm. hardly realize it and are aware of it in many instances. For sure. What are some of the the ramifications that you see? Like, what are what are some of the long term implications of colonialism in, in the way that you're referring to it? Well, it even goes down to race. You know, um, we we're made to, to to think that white is better. We were made to think that uh, when I was growing up in Jamaica, it was uh, Africa was referred to with uh, reticence. Mm -hmm. And to this day, uh, very few not very few, but people are some. A lot of people are somewhat reluctant to refer to themselves as Afro-Canadian or Afro-American or Afro-whatever. And one of the things that you say there is uh, a lot of Jamaicans, for example, when you ask them about their ancestry, the they will say, "Oh, I got Irish, and I might have Scottish, and I've got Indian, and the last." piece of it they they want to mention is they're African. Mm. It, that's very rampant, I think, even in today's society. Fair enough. So you 
you having been a product of this system now as a young man arrive in Canada. And one of the things that you chronicle in this in this text is all the different and sundry jobs that you had coming up. Um, there are a number of them listed in the in the book, but I'm just curious about having having come up now through the the education system in Jamaica that you refer to as you know unrelentingly British. You end up in Canada. There's clearly not a whole lot of people that look like you. Um, what was it like when you first arrived? Um, what were some of the things that you observed? How did you find your footing in a country that was foreign to you um, in a number of ways? Well, I took after my father in terms of officiousness. I was not afraid to stand up to people. And I didn't allow myself to be pushed around. But it was intimidating. For example, in a, in a, in a large class, just because of your accent, you were afraid of asking any questions in a, in a university class. Because you get up and open your mouth and he says, by the minute you say, sir, you have 50 eyes glued upon you yeah. and wondering about you and so forth. But, and, and you know you were uh, not welcome, you know, um, even right up to the, the head of the college. When I was at McGill, I borrowed $200 from the bursar one year. And he was a nice man, very nice man, Mr. Puxley. And he told me all the ins and outs of how to get the loan, you know, and he said, you know, if you, if you, if you paid off when you, at the end of the summer, we lend it right back to you, roll it over. So at the end of the summer, I paid, uh, paid it off and put in an application. But Mr. Puxley was downsized. So I had to go to the dean of the college now, Dr. Dion. Mm -hmm. And when in his office was the size of my house, he must have been expecting me. I didn't just knock a walk in, his secretary showed me in. And uh, first thing he said, uh, so why are you here? <laughs> I said, well, sir, I had borrowed $200 and uh, Mr. Puxley said if I had paid it off, I, I went away with my application, right? Uh, Mr. Puxley said if I, had pay, if I paid it off, I could borrow it again. Knowing for a while Mr. Puxley was downsized, he said to me, so go to Mr. Puxley. <laughs> so... So I walked out of there and I tore it up and I said, you know what? If I have to eat pieces, I'm, I, you won't see me again. I didn't say it to him, but I went back to my room, tore it up and threw it in the wastebasket. Mm -hmm. but, but those are the things uh, we had to put up with. But, you know, I dug ditches. Funnily enough, they're, re, they're re, uh, redecorating or, or renewing Regent Park. They're building high rises there and putting up new buildings. Mm -hmm. And during my university years, I worked for the Metro to tear down the old buildings that had put up the buildings that they're tearing down now. Well, so I've been here long enough to see even real estate go full cycle. Mm -hmm. I, I dug ditches. I, uh, I worked in breweries. Uh, I did landscaping. I uh, had so many jobs. I had a job at uh, the Canadian National Railway loading the trains. And uh, I spent a year, a couple of years at Dalhousie University. And so at the end of the summer, my foreman fixed me up and I rode the boxcar. I rode the boxcar from Toronto to Halifax. Wow. To go back to school. So uh, I've done it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, especially if I if I talk about people my age, we'll see you come on the scene with Flow 93.5 and not know the blood, sweat and tears that have gone into you arriving at that place. But there was a question actually that came up in the chat about Flow. And so I'm curious, 
why was that something that you were so passionate about and why did you not give up on seeing flow come to fruition well you know first of all i i tell, lately i've said to my, I, i'm going to answer that question by saying i was a long distance runner in school i ran the cross country and i ran a mile and did pretty good times so i don't give up easily mm -hmm. it took us 12 years and three applications to get that that station. I saw a, a white lady recently who was in pharmaceuticals say how difficult it is to break into an industry when it's not traditional. Mm. She says, first they laugh at you. Then they ignore you. And then they fight you, and then you win. Hmm. After our first application, I decided I'm not going to give up. I'm going to be in your face. The way that works is you have to make an application to the Canadian Radio and Television Commission. And they have a hearing where five or six or 18 people, I've been to hearings where there are 18 people. And you sit in front of them and they interview you and they finally decide three or four years three or four months later well after they rejected us the first time we uh, decided we're not going to go away and every hearing they would have it were it in coburg i would go and sit in the front row so they could see me even if i'm not applying if they had one in montreal i'd be there in the front row if they had one in Quebec City, I'd be there in the front row so the commissioners mm. could see me and know I'm not I'm not getting out of your face. And we applied three times and we had overwhelming support for it. We had more what they call interventions, people signing letters. In one instance, when for 99.1, which is what the CDC has now, one of them, we had like 14,000 interventions and the CBC had like 4,000. So we were relenting. We were unrelenting with them. I thought it was important because we have to be seen everywhere. We have to explore all avenues. I have a friend who recently became, uh, got a very important position and he was very uh, ambivalent about it, mostly because he was had to give up his activism. And I said, you know what, X, don't worry about it. We have to be seen in positions of power. That's part of the fight. Let people see you in that position. They know we're not all on welfare. And furthermore, I thought that we needed voices. We needed, uh, at the time we, I applied for the radio station, I had the contrast newspaper. But mm -hmm. it was a weekly paper. So if something happens on Thursday, you don't hear about it until the next Thursday. But radio is instant and it's local. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, at that time, we had a lot of artists in the city um, that were in their basements and their garages. And I figured these people needed a, a venue to hear their craft. At the time, black music was not played in Toronto. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to hear black music, you had to tune into Waffle or Detroit. In fact, if someone was having a reggae concert here, they had to advertise it in Buffalo because there was no means of advertising in Toronto on the Toronto radio station. So we needed a black outlet here. And in the end, I thought I'm very proud of it because not only did we well, the weekend, the weekend was open. That was at the uh, halftime show at uh, the Super Bowl. A Super Bowl, and I figure I'm not going to take credit for it, but I think being the first station to play rhythm and blues and R and B and reggae in this city, mm -hmm. it inspired and gave all the artists in this city an outlet for their music. Mm -hmm. Flo was the first station to play Drake. We were the first station to put Drake in live mainstream radio. So mm. I think that opened it up. Furthermore, there was one black guy working in the radio business, a guy named Harris 
in Alberta who was an ex wide receiver in football. And if you it, now and after flow, we had program directors, music directors, station managers. Mm -hmm. It was open right up. People got the skills that they they they, they need in radio. Mm -hmm. And after flow, we had people on the morning show from Vancouver to Halifax. So I think it was important to open up that area for black people to enter because we sure. have the talent to do it. So you weren't only bringing a voice to the masses, you were also building an infrastructure of skills that people Thank you could very use. much. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. For sure, for sure. So, I mean, Flow was one of the many fights that you've been a part of. You referenced in one of your um, previous answers, Buddy Evans, as uh, and you talk about it in detail in the book as well. Um, you know, you've been a part of a number of different struggles, different sacrifices, successes in terms of the uplift of black communities in, in Canada. What's your sense of where we are right now, 2021, and, and where do we go from here? I think that we have made some progress. Uh, but as I say to people after the George Floyd marching where the prime minister himself took a knee, the chief of police in Toronto who's gone now, God bless his soul. I say that with a tongue in my cheek. Uh, he's gone. Uh, <laughs> but I say to people, after all that demonstration, and I appreciate all the nice white people, a lot of them were sincere, that came out. Name me a couple substantive changes that you have seen in Canada, in Canada and in the Ontario in particular. And I struggle to identify improvement in substantive institutional areas that are going to help my son after all that kerfuffle last summer. Mm -hmm. Very few, very few. And, you know, I saved this at the, uh, I, uh, I think this is a good point for me to, to, to talk about this. Uh, a few months ago, I saw an editorial in the Toronto Star and very authentic, written by an ex-Chief Justice of Canada's Supreme Court, Beverly McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked. I was totally shocked because she pointed out that in the judicial system, uh, in what she referred to as on the ground justice, Canada ranked 52nd in the world. Mm. That's probably a shock to a lot of people. Mm. And then I saw this editorial in 2018, I saw this editorial, which said in the past 15 years, the incarceration rate for Canada of indig indigenous people had increased by 50%, of blacks, 90%, and of whites, a decrease of 5%. Go figure and ponder those numbers. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is a lot of talk and, and not a whole lot of action when it comes to addressing the things that people said were important in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Absolutely. You know, my sister, the motto of my sister's high school was Esse non videri. Mm. And it means to be and not to seem. Walk the talk. Mm. Fair enough. So what's next for you? I mean, it's not like you're going to, um, you know, just be quiet. So what's well, happening to you? Well, I'm, you in, I'm in... Uh, I have a retirement, but my raison debt is to right wrongs, is to stand up for justice. Mm -hmm. And I can't see an injustice and not address it as long as there's life in my body. So that's it, to help people where I can. I uh, am sponsoring a boys' uh, region park 
Tr- on the 12 soccer team, we they were first in their league last summer. Mm-hmm. And things of that nature. I started a breakfast program at my old high school in Jamaica, Conway College. We feed 60 kids a day there. And uh, just this morning, I had a, a discussion with uh, a director of the food bank over here at St. Jamestown. I uh, like to help people and stand up for justice. Mm-hmm. So you're not slowing down. You're just changing gears. Yeah, and I'm slowing down, but I'm helping where I can and doing the things that I have the ability and the strength to do. Fair enough. So I want to ask you a couple of questions that have come up in the chat. We started off um, this conversation talking about an interaction that you had with a Toronto police officer and, and the conversation expanded to some of the the uh, struggles that you've been a part of or fights that you've been a part of in that vein. And so one of the questions that came up in the chat was, um, what piece of advice would you have for young black people today in the way they deal with police? Deal with them respectfully, but expect the same in return. Mm -hmm. You have to be well versed in your rights. Obviously, you can't go in the sea and not be able to swim. So I'd say it is a lot of people, a lot of parents talk about the talk. I think it behooves most young people to be aware of their rights and aware of the pitfalls that await them out there with police. Mm. And you have to be in coalition with other people who can stand up for you. Mm -hmm. It's not a fight for any one person or any one group. We have to form coalitions. We have to form coalitions with the First Nations people. We have to form coalitions with the Chinese people. We have to form coalitions with the Jews, and we have to try and present a united front. Mm-hmm. And above all, you have to know your rights when you go on these these streets in Canada. For sure. So um, thank you for that. And I, I know it's kind of disparate, but I want to make sure I get to some of the questions that were asked in the chat. So I'm switching gears again for a second. No so problem. Yes. All right. Good stuff. You're keeping up, though. I must say, like you're ahead of me. You know, what well, I mean? not, not really. I'm 85 years old, but uh, I love to talk. 85. My goodness. Black don't crack, as they say. Yeah, so let me yeah. ask you this. So it's February. We're in the midst of Black History Month. Um, you know, there you've you've seen a number of these Black History Months come and go over the course of your time in this country. Uh, I guess the question that the the individual in the chat was asking was, what does Black History Month mean to you? Uh, is it enough? Um, what what sort of should be our goal in Canada when it comes to the celebration of the contributions of Black Canadians? Well, to me, Black History Month means that we can present ourselves to others and others can learn about us and about our accomplishments or contributions and probably get an awareness and appreciation of what we brought to the table. And in fact, I think it also a learning opportunity for ourselves. Because a lot of Blacks, I always say that we have a very rich heritage and that's one of the things that we have to fortify ourselves with to get self-esteem and be able to stay away from drugs and guns and what have you it all starts from a lack of self-esteem so even it's even for ourselves Um, we have been accused of being at the foot of the totem pole, welfare recipients, yagada, yagada. How many of our people and how many young blacks know that Timbuktu was the center of learning in Mali? Mm-hmm. That the ruler of Mali around the 13th century was, a, was of course, a black man named 
Master Musa, Musa, Master Musa. And he was one of the richest men the world has ever seen. Master Musa was worth, in today's money, $400 billion in gold. How many of our people know that? How many people know it was the center of learning? How many people know that we were doing chemistry and trigonometry there before Europe? People have to realize the very rich heritage and history that we have in Africa where we came from, that we predate Europe in terms of learning. Mm -hmm. And I think that that now it's it's uh well some of the things are willfully left out. Um the the in Canada, we're guilty of the sins of omission when it, it comes to our history. Mm -hmm. Matthew Lacoste has been here since 1603. He, he took Champlain up the St. Lawrence River. Mm -hmm. 400 years ago, blacks have been here. And peop, people are still, and we have to be made to make sure that these things are learned. Mm -hmm. People are still don't want our history to be known. Recently, my partner came to me and said, oh, you have to know, you have to know about this girl. She's a Jamaican girl who came here about eight years ago. She goes to Ryerson. She's doing biomedical physics. And is doing research at Sunnybrook. I saw it in, and on uh, this lady Dennis on TV and I saved it. So mm -hmm. we watched it. And after the program, th this girl was awarded a global award for. Uh, she was giving away hygiene products and she got a global award for it. Mm -hmm. So I watched the program and. Marilyn Dennis interviewed her. She was she grew up very poor in Jamaica. Didn't have hygiene products, did all kinds of things to make do. He came to Canada, decided to do something about it and started this. This uh, organization and distributed all around the world, so she got this uh, award. And then the program ended. 